Welcome to Caravan, the art of wayfaring podcast that tells the stories of people and places in Turkey. Politicians get a bad rap. If there was ever a time that the populace implicitly trusted the leaders of their country simply because they held respected positions of authority, that time is over. That's why, for so many foreigners pouring into Turkey year after year, the local veneration of the founder of the Turkish Republic is so baffling and so fascinating. His image is on the money. In many cities, there is no public gathering space where his portrait does not hang. Busts of his likeness and statues of his proudest moments endure in parks and schoolyards and roadways everywhere. His most repeated quotes are embossed in steel and carved into stone to remind passers-by what he thought and how he taught the Turkish people. Many tattoo parlors even will tattoo his name on your skin for free just to show off the grandeur and endurance of his legacy. We are, of course, talking about the most towering figure in modern Turkish history, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Kemal was born on the 19th of May, 1881, in the then Ottoman town of Selanik, today's Thessaloniki. His was a fairly typical middle-class Ottoman family. His father was both an officer in the local militia and a clerk, and his mother was a housewife. Even though three children were born to the household, only Kemal and his sister would survive to adulthood. Kemal's mother, who was a deeply respected woman, and is even to this day, put him into religious school while he was still a young boy. Even at that tender age, the secular leanings that would come to typify his later leadership shone through and he asked to be removed from the school. After attending reluctantly for some time, he was finally moved to a secular local school by his father. Kemal was a bright student. It was while still attending grade school that he earned the epithet Kemal, actually. The name means perfection or maturity in Turkish, and it's said that it was given to him by a teacher who was astounded at his acumen. An alternative and much less romantic story is told that there were just several boys in the class named Mustafa, and so the teacher gave the nickname to him to distinguish him from the other boys. Although his family imagined he would embrace the life of a merchant and make money in the business world, Kemal was always interested in the military. After attending two military academies to complete his childhood education, Kemal found himself in Istanbul, the capital of the empire. He graduated from the final academy in 1905 and joined the military as a young officer. Now, there are many legends about Ataturk as a young man. It's actually quite hard to get an accurate picture of him through historians who fawn over him or from historians who vilify him. Both the mythos and the controversy that he stirred up over the years has yet to settle to give us a clear image of many different seasons of his life, despite the volumes that have been written about him. But it is agreed that he was a smooth social operator from the very beginning. He learned several languages and was well-read and had a talent for insinuating himself at the trendiest cafes and bars. Though a Muslim, he was known to drink heavily and loved to party. He was strong-willed and outspoken and he freely discussed the ideals that he was cultivating in his young mind. Shortly after graduating, at the inception of his career, Kemal was arrested for being a part of an organization that stood against the Sultanate. He was no lover of the sultan, and he was always jealous of the man at the top. Kemal was competitive and ambitious, and he saw in the old Ottoman world the mentality that kept people stuck in the positions that they were born into. He only spent a short time incarcerated, but as further punishment, he was posted far away from the cosmopolitan and intellectual city that he had grown to love. While in Damascus, he was a key founding member of yet another revolutionary secret society called Motherland and Liberty. Later, while posted in a city called Monastir, he joined the most successful of these revolutionary groups, known in the West as the Young Turks, but in Turkey, they called themselves the Committee of Union and Progress. Driven and hungry for change, Kemal wanted to act. He got his chance in 1908 when the Young Turk Revolution seized power from the Sultan, Abdul Hamid II. Taking control of the leadership of the country, they decided not to depose the leader. Instead, the young Turks forcibly pushed the country to restore the constitutional monarchy and began to operate from key roles in the government. One can imagine the personality mix of military personnel and bold leaders and politicians that would move against a 600-year-old monarchy. Unsurprisingly, Kemal found himself at odds with the other strong wills within the organization. 
Until that point in his life, he didn't have the social and political capital required to win the ensuing standoffs. So when he fell out with some of the revolutionaries who used their influence against him, he was sent off once again to a distant posting. For the next few years, Kemal would serve in the military and participate in real combat. He learned lessons about leadership from the battlefield during the Italian-Turkish Wars and the Balkan Wars. And through it all, he honed his ideologies like a blade. As in his academy years, he favored European dress and etiquette more and more and found himself in the middle of a few romances. Even though he was essentially anonymous, penniless, and without much power or authority, it is said of him at this time of his life that he carried himself with an almost infuriating superiority. Self-doubt was certainly not one of his vices. Letters from this season of life reveal that he'd begun to give voice to the suspicion that it was the sultanate and religion together that were holding the empire back. When he compared the relatively impoverished, shrinking Ottoman Empire with the progressive countries of Europe, Mustafa Kemal felt shame. He had always been a nationalist, but as time went on, a deep discontent to be a part of anything that he felt was inferior began to bubble up inside. If he was to be a part of Turkey, he reasoned, then Turkey would need to be made great. Then, while the empire was dealing with small wars and internal issues, the Balkan powder keg exploded with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The Great War had begun and was quickly dragging countries in with unprecedented bloodshed and speed. In the first year of the war, Kemal was given command of the 19th Division during the Battle of Gallipoli and Çanakkale. After being a part of the Ottoman victory there, Ataturk distinguished himself in the Caucasus, recapturing territory lost to the Russians. Despite these military victories, the writing was on the wall for the Ottoman Empire. They were the weakest of the central powers and had been losing territory for generations. Kemal saw that the defeat was coming, but he also saw the opportunity for a new country to rise from the shattered remains of the empire. In the heat of war, he had performed well and learned much, not least of which was the value of his identity as a hero. From this point on, Kemal would work to control what we would now call the optics of his life, minimizing or ignoring failure while he emphasized success. In the twilight months of the war, Kemal began to lay the foundation for later resistance against occupying forces. He conserved his men and equipment, opting for controlled retreats whenever possible, and even distributing weapons he knew would later be confiscated when the Allies took over the country. And then, the thing he had been preparing for happened. The war was over, and the Ottomans had lost. In fact, it seemed like they had lost everything. For the first time since 1453, an invading infidel army occupied Istanbul. British, Italian, French, and Greek troops poured into the former Ottoman territories and began to partition the land. As I've already mentioned, the Ottomans had been losing whole countries' worth of land for centuries. But the nationalist Turks who wanted control when the Ottoman sultan was gone saw Anatolia as completely different. In defeat, they and Ataturk, like them, were willing to give up the Levant, North Africa, and the Arab countries, but they were not prepared to surrender Anatolia. The Allied agreements that carved out countries with names today like Iraq and Syria left only about 60% of central Anatolia to what was envisioned to be a Turkish nation. The Turks would lose Istanbul, Izmir, and many other cities that they deemed to be their own. The occupation of these cities and the empowerment of non-Muslim minorities put the defeated Turks over the edge. Many groups, mostly led by veterans from the First World War, began to form underground resistance movements across the land. Kemal was one of these who sprung into action. He saw an opportunity to bring into fruition all the things he had dreamed about from his youth and to vent all the offenses he felt in defeat. He crisscrossed Anatolia, taking political action and organizing military strikes. He absorbed smaller anti-occupation forces under his command and styled himself the leader of the Turkish national movement and sought to take control for the War of Independence. The years of political maneuvering and military action stretched from the end of World War I to 1923. 
During that time, the Ottoman Empire was officially dissolved. The Sultan and his family were deposed and fled to the West, and the Turkish Grand National Assembly was opened in Ankara. At the time, Ankara was a relatively unimportant, medium-sized city in central Anatolia. Necessity, tactical advantage, and a break from the past all called for a rather... Necessity, tactics, and a break from the past all convinced the new country that their capital should be away from Istanbul. Ankara, it was thought, would make a better location. The Republic of Turkey was officially recognized and established on October 29, 1923, and Mustafa Kemal had been a central figure in setting it up. At that point, he took off his uniform and retired from military action, never to don it again. Although the occupiers had been pushed out and the republic had been founded, the work was far from over for the fledgling Turkish country. Most of the world had been shattered by the loss of life in World War I, and Turkey had not only fought the length of the war, but also continued in conflict for an additional four years after the armistice. Kemal was not alone in holding a vision of a shining future for Turkey, but he held the most potent combination of ambition and political power. He had been the speaker for the assembly, and now he was president of an initially one-party government. He knew that this was the time to bring the sweeping social reforms that he had envisioned 20 years earlier while he was still with the Young Turks. The people wanted change, and many had begun to look to Kemal as a savior. Reform began swiftly. I want you to bring to mind all the stereotypical pictures you have of the Middle East a hundred years ago. And that would probably paint at least a vague picture of what Turkey was like. The population was mostly Muslim, mostly rural. On the street, you would see robes and turbans and fezes and long beards. Men would gather around steaming cups of Turkish coffee and hookah. Women would be covered and had very little public function. Many families, especially in the East, were polygamist. And literacy was only around 10%. Turkey is a bridge between the East and the West. It straddles Europe in the West and Asia in the East in a way that no other country does. Kemal had decided long ago that the country made in his image would lean toward Europe to bring itself out of what he considered a dark age. It would be difficult to overstate the transformation that swept Turkey under Kemal's direction over the ensuing 15 years. Reforms began immediately and they touched every level of society. His first move was to secularize the country. Kemal said, quote, The religion of Islam will be elevated if it will cease to be a political instrument as it has been in the past, end quote. This would prove to be a tricky task. For five centuries, Turkey had been home to the caliphate, the political heart of Islam. He abolished that caliphate. Then he abolished the Sharia courts. He closed many religious schools, focusing primarily on eliminating Sufism. All Sufi madrasas, which is a type of discipleship and theology school, were banned, and the buildings turned into museums. The separation of mosque and state also touched the way people dressed. The fez, that little red hat that Aladdin wears, was outlawed in public, and soon only imams were allowed to wear turbans. He encouraged women to join public life without wearing a hijab or anything covering their heads, something his adopted daughters and his second wife would model for the country. In the 20s, in Turkey, what you wore said much about you. Atatürk popularized the fedora and top hat and pushed others to adopt the same. For the first time, the suit and tie began to overpower the Central Asian robes of the past on the streets. It later became illegal for a man to have more than one wife. Then came a two-pronged approach to both elevate the position of women in society and reform education. Kemal said, quote, To the women, Win for us the battle of education, and you will do yet more for your country than we have been able to do. It is to you that I appeal. To the men, If henceforth women do not share in the social life of the nation, we shall never attain to our full development. We shall remain irremediably backward, incapable of treating on equal terms with the civilization in the West. For the first time, mandatory schooling was legally required for all children of both genders. 
Classroom segregation was over as well. Women and men learned together for the first time at university and trade schools, and eventually that unity stretched all the way down to the elementary school level. The political arena was opened wide to women as well. In 1935, there were 18 female MPs in the Grand National Assembly, a higher ratio by far than the British House of Commons or the U.S. House of Representatives that same year. Kimmel thought that language reform was needed as well. In the 1920s, people were still speaking Osmanlıca, or Ottoman Turkish, as well as many minority languages at home. Osmanlıca borrowed many words from Persian and Arabic. Ataturk gathered linguists and scholars together and tasked them with recreating the Turkish language. Imagine moving from the English Shakespeare spoke to the English your grandfather spoke in a single generation. But more than that, too, because Osmanlıca used the Arabic script. The language reforms did away with that and instead moved to a Latin alphabet with a few less consonants and a couple extra vowels. This simplification, along with education initiatives, raised the literacy rate by 12% in the first 13 years. Kemal even changed the way that people named themselves. Yes, at this point, only minorities, not Turks, had surnames. It was during the surname reform that Mustafa Kemal became Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, which means father of the Turks. Atatürk, in fact, is a special surname that can only ever legally belong to him. For years, Atatürk worked tirelessly. These new initiatives were not without critics, and they were not without victims. The bloody conflict between Turks and Kurds, which continues on to our day, was accelerated in this time. Turkey was to be a Turkish republic, Atatürk taught. Turkish was the language, the national identity, the worldview, and the value system. But the Ottoman Empire had been multicultural and had allowed for many disparate cultural identities. To unify the country, Kemal saw it necessary to enforce assimilation or to drive minorities out. For instance, it became illegal to take a Greek, Armenian, or Kurdish last name or to use a suffix from those languages in one's own surname. This is also the time when over a million Orthodox Christians, even Turkish ones, were sent to Greece. The population exchange uprooted whole communities on both sides of the border, sending Muslims to Turkey and Christians to Greece. In the 20s, one in four people living in Turkey were a part of a Christian minority, but by the end of the century, it would be less than 5%. Minority Orthodox of various racial identities were Anatolia's artisans. Suddenly, whole industries were lost across the land as the Greeks and Armenians and Suriani especially disappeared. By 1937, Ataturk was beginning to show the strain of this monumental struggle. He had smoked and drank heavily, and he worked endlessly. In his lifetime, he fought communists, fascists, and monarchs who opposed his ideologies. He cajoled and schmoozed and smashed local and national leaders into line with his new republic. He also adopted a number of daughters and tried to raise a family. Among them was the world's first female fighter pilot, Sabiha Gökçen. But in the end, he had won. He had become the character he created for himself in his own mind. By the force of his will and his shrewd operating, he created a new worldview for his country and was able to position himself at the center, both as its founder and as its ideal citizen. Though his ego was massive, He was genuinely driven for the betterment of the Turkish people. It cost him two wives, one to suicide and one to divorce. It cost him his health. At just 56 years old, he was diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver. Within a year, on November 10th, 1938, Atatürk died on the shores of the Bosphorus in Istanbul in Dolmabahçe Palace at exactly 9.05 a.m. The room he passed away in is preserved as it was left to this day, and the clock is set to that time to show the moment of his death. Despite the controversy that surrounded him, an opposing political party decided to ban insults to the memory of Atatürk by law in Turkey in 1951. Every year, on the day and the minute of his death, the country stops what it's doing and turns to face the place where he died. Today, 
If you would like to see his final resting place, you can visit the gargantuan mausoleum in Ankara called the Anant Kabir. The complex is guarded 24-7 by a joint forces honor guard comprised of army, navy, and air force personnel. Whether or not you make it there, if you visit Turkey today, it is impossible to miss the impact of this most singular man, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Caravan is written, produced, and recorded by me, Sean Stevenson Douglas. Music was written and performed by our good friend Tarek Yilmaz. If you want to hear more about life and adventures in Turkey, find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit www.artofwayfaring.com. You'll find fresh content posted weekly on our website.